Okay, this is a video for section 10.2, uh, estimating a population mean, and we're going to learn about something a little bit new called the t-interval. Uh, last section in section 10.1, we talked about, we really spent a lot of time laying the kind of foundation for confidence intervals, and I really tried to get you to see how confidence intervals relate to the sampling uh, distribution issues we did in chapter 9. Um, so last section, we learned about this formula, right? This is the formula we used over and over again in section 10.1. x bar plus or minus z star sigma over root n. Um, statistic plus or minus uh, margin of error, okay? Well, I kind of glossed over this in section 10.1. I slipped up a couple times, but just think about this for a second. In all the problems we did back in section 10.1, I gave you a value for sigma. And this is the standard deviation of the population. Okay. Well, at the time, realize we're only really doing inference for an unknown parameter mu. Right? We're doing a confidence interval because we don't know mu. Well, it seems really surprising there could be any kind of realistic situation where you didn't know mu, but for some reason you actually knew sigma. That almost it's actually almost impossible because actually the formula for sigma involves mu. That's really a contrived situation, and actually we only kind of came up with that almost imaginary, dreamlike situation because it made the math a little bit simpler. In the real world, this formula will almost never get used because you would only be able to use this formula if you didn't know mu and you did know sigma, and that's just never going to happen. Okay, we only talked about it in section 10.1 because it's useful to make that kind of silly assumption when you're learning confidence intervals for the very, very first time in your life. In the real world, that never happens. And so section 10.2 builds on the ideas in section 10.1, but kind of throws away that lie and says, okay, now we're really not going to know sigma. Now what do we do? And what we do is we end up doing something a little bit different. It's not called a Z interval anymore. It's going to be called a T interval. And this is going to, T interval and a Z interval work almost exactly the same way, but now for a Z interval, you make the silly assumption you know sigma. For a t interval, we're not going to make that silly assumption anymore. So actually, it's a really kind of easy call. When do you use a z interval and when do you use a t interval? You use a t interval if you don't know sigma. You use a z interval if you do know sigma. The reality is you're never going to know sigma. So often we end up using a t interval. So this is a complete worked out example. A um, little, little bit uh, long, but we'll talk about some of the details. Um, so it says in an SRS of 44 cars, the mean miles per gallon in that sample, so this is an X bar, is 19.6 with a sa sample standard deviation of 3.1. And that's really important. Okay, this is an important difference from the last one. This number right here is actually not a sigma. It's not the standard deviation of the population. This is an S. It's the standard deviation of the sample. In the previous problems, it was really unrealistic that you would ever know sigma. But it is somewhat realistic you can know S. You can calculate the standard deviation of the samples. This is a much more realistic problem. And then it says estimate mu using a 95% confidence interval. So again, I'll run through the inference toolbox, and I did it in different colors. Okay, the unknown parameter mu is the unknown population mean miles per gallon. We know our X bar is 19.6. We don't know what mu is. That's what we're trying to do. Then I run through my three conditions. It says it's a simple random sample. A little bit of a difference here, since n is equal to 44, we say the t distribution is appropriate, and that's, I'll talk about what that kind of means uh, in a future slide. But it's really one of the only differences between the two problems. Independence, there are more than 10 times 44 cars in whatever population you're talking about. Now take a look at this formula. This is the new formula for uh, this section 10.2. How is it different than the other one? Only two differences. S right here is it says S, we used to use sigma, but now we use S. Um, sigma is the population standard deviation, S is the sample standard deviation. And then it turns out we use a new thing called T star instead of Z star. Um, and there's a new distribution called T I'll talk to you about, but, and it's basically you calculate it sort of the same way. We used to use inverse norm, now we're going to use inverse T. From then on it's exactly the same, 19.6 is X bar, we got this using inverse t in our calculator, and I'll talk about how to do that in a second. S was 3.1, square root of n is 44. We get a margin of error of 0.94. We calculate this interval, and again, our calculator can do this all for us. And then the step four of the inference toolbox is exactly the same. I'm 95% confident the population mean miles per gallon is between 18.6 and 20.5.
Um, the only real difference, there's only two differences between this section and the one previous one. The first is this difference between sigma and s. You use s here. Instead of using sigma, it's t star instead of z star, which you get in the calculator a little different way. And then this check right in here, the middle check on your conditions, we don't use the word normal anymore because we, we just say the t distribution is appropriate. And we'll talk about those dis distinctions later on. Okay, this is a complete worked out example. Notice how, notice how similar it is to the ones in the previous section. So here I want to just talk to you a little bit about this new thing called the t-distribution. And it's a slightly different distribution than the normal distribution. I tried to draw you a little picture here, not that I'm a great artist, but if this is a normal distribution, the kind of gray one, a t-distribution still looks very similar. It's still unimodal, it's still symmetric, the only difference is it's a little bit fatter on the tails, or you might say it's a little bit flatter. It has a smaller peak in the middle. And it turns out that the T distribution is a better distribution to use when you're using S instead of sigma for a sampling distribution. So again, the rule is really simple. It's just if you know S, you use the T distribution. If you know sigma, for some inexplicable reason, you use the normal distribution. Or again, sometimes we call the normal distribution the Z distribution because we're talking about Z scores. Um, so if I ask you to draw a T distribution, kind of looks normal-ish, except it's just a little bit fatter on the tails. The one weird thing about a t-distribution is there's not just one different t-distribution. There actually are many, many, many different t-curves. And they all relate to something called degrees of freedom. Each of the different t-curves has a different degrees of freedom. Now, degrees of freedom is going to be a huge topic if you ever like take a graduate court in statistics in college. But for right now, just think about degrees of freedom. There's a formula for it, which is just one less than the sample size. So, for example, if your sample size was 30, the degrees of freedom would be 29. If your sample size is 7, the degrees of freedom would be 6. Just one less. Here I've tried to draw many, many, many different... These are all T-curves with different degrees of freedom. And basically what you have to know is that for a small degrees of freedom, it's much flatter. As the degrees of freedom gets higher, pretty close to kind of being 30, it starts looking more normal. So you'll notice here, for the smaller degrees of freedom, it's much flatter. For the more degrees of freedom, it's end up being more normal-like. And that's basically what you have to know about the T-curve. Um, very, very normal-looking, uni still unimodal and symmetric. It's not actually normal, though. It's just fatter on the tails. That previous problem I just showed you two slides ago, you can actually do completely on the calculator. Um, Again, you go to the test, second calc, or not so you don't, you go to uh, stat tests. We were in this menu before, before we used number seven, which was a Z interval when we knew sigma. Now we just go one down and do what's called a T interval, which you, how do you know whether you use a Z or a T interval? If you know sigma, you use a T, a Z interval, number seven. If you don't know sigma, but you do know S, you use number eight, which is a, a T interval. Look at what it asked you. Before it asked you for sigma, now it doesn't ask you for sigma, it asks you for S. Again, sigma population standard deviation, S sampled standard deviation. And you just punch in all these numbers. These are the numbers from the previous problem, 19.6, uh, 3.1, 44, the problem said to be 95% confident. And then, hey, look, it gives us this answer here right away. Now, one thing that's a little bit tricky is that this, is, this can actually get you the final answer, right, which is really sort of right here, right? But you have to, on, the, on a test or on the AP, show knowledge of the formula. Well, the formula we know is x bar plus or minus t star s over the square root of n. A lot of these things we just know so we can plug in, right? x bar is 19.6. t star I'm going to come back to. s is 3.1 and then n in this problem is the square root of 44. The thing we want to talk about is what goes here. How do we possibly figure out what the t star value is? And the answer is your calculator can actually figure this out. <clears throat> right below inverse norm on your calculator is something called inverse t. Now when you type in just inverse norm it only took one number which was the percentile, the area from the left. Inverse t actually takes two numbers 
Okay, what, the first is the percentile to the left, just like inverse norm. The second number, though, has to be the degrees of freedom, because remember, there's many, many, many different t curves. And if you just said inverse t for 0.975, it wouldn't know which t curve you're talking about. So you have to give it the degrees of freedom, which again, degrees of freedom is just 44, which is the sample size, minus 1. That's where the 43 came from. And then it cranks it all out for you. So if you were to show knowledge of the formula, you would say 19.6. Then you would do this inverse t calculation and get 2.01669 times 3.1 over the square root of 44. Now, again, you're just doing this to really show knowledge of the formula. Once you write that down on your paper, sure, you can just go back here and actually this, this calculation is exactly this. So you're kind of just doing this to pretend that you're using, doing it the long way and really letting your calculator crank out all the heavy lifting. And just the last thing I wanted to talk about is a little bit of vocabulary. We've seen that the formula for all confidence intervals is statistic plus or minus margin of error. I want to just introduce a little a new vocabulary word, which is this term critical value and standard error. Notice what I've written down here. What I've circled in red is the complete margin of error. It's everything after the plus or the minus. So this entire thing after the plus or minus is called the margin of error. The T star value is called the critical value. It's the critical like number of standard deviations, sort of, if you want to think about it like that. In the previous section, Z star was also a critical value. Sort of anything star is the critical value. And then what we do after that, S divided by the square root of N, has a new name. We just call it standard error. I just wanted you to see that because our book will use these terms margin of error, critical value, and standard error, and I want you to see that relationship. The margin of error is everything after the plus or minus, and the margin of error is made up of the critical value times the standard error, and that makes up the complete margin of error. It's, it's easy to mix up margin of error and standard error. Margin of error includes the T star or Z star. Standard error does not. And that really is all section 2.2. Sorry, not 2.2, oh my gosh, 10.2. And we'll do lots of examples in class to give you a lot of practice with the button pushing on the calculator and um, the, the following the inference toolbox and also kind of getting knowledge of the uh, formula. So we'll do lots and lots of examples in class. But that's section 10.2.